Our um, invocation this evening will be offered by Lori Dean Wiley, member of Epic Church. Lori Dean. If you'd like to join me, bow your head. Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come to you, to request, to praise, and to uh, thank you for all that you've provided for us. Please be with our local, our state, and our national leaders and provide for our citizens as you see fit. In your name I pray, amen. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, Lord. one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam State Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Huck? Here. Perkins? Here. Stewart? Here. DeLucy? Here. Steinmeier? Here. Robart? Here. Mayor Ware? Here. Here. Uh, before we get into our agenda this evening, I know we're all aware of the very um, critical situation that we have been dealing with for the last couple of days with the weather and the rolling uh, blackouts. So I would just like to begin by asking uh, the city manager to provide a, an out, a, uh, a report on the situation as, as it stands. Mr. City Manager. Yes, uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, as all of you are too painfully aware, um, the unprecedented level of cold weather that we're experiencing across the country right now uh, has put a pretty significant demand uh, on supply, uh, particularly for natural gas uh, and for electricity. Uh, the city is part of a very large consortium known as the Southwest Power Pool. That is a, a group of power suppliers across a 14 state region that services something close to 17 million people within that 14 state region. Um, that area stretches all the way from Texas uh, up into Montana, um, as far east as Missouri and as far west over as um, extreme western Kansas. Uh, with that level of demand exceeding available supply the last few days, the Southwest Power Pool had to require um, participants in that pool to shed load, as it's known. Um, so yesterday, uh, we were required to shed three megawatts of energy uh, that impacted about 6,000 customers. Uh, this morning, we were asked to shed uh, four times that. We were asked to shed 12 megawatts of energy. And uh, over that three-hour period, that impacted about 29,000 of our customers. So in the last 24 hours, there's been about 33,000 of our customers who at uh, some interval of a 20 to 30-minute period were, were without power. Um, that could last uh, through tomorrow based on the cold weather. Uh, we really just don't know. It's a matter of, again, demand and supply. Uh, that's why the messaging has been placed out, uh, asking everybody to try to conserve energy as best as possible. Um, but as long as the cold weather persists uh, and with the city's participation and agreements in this uh, power pool arrangement that we currently have, uh, that is a, a reality we've been faced, forced to deal with. Uh, hopefully, as the weather improves, uh, demand will slowly begin to creep back down and normalize, uh, and we can get uh, out from under this mess. Happy to answer any questions, Mayor, um, on that if you need, or otherwise, we'll just proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. City Manager. I know that we will have opportunity for input on this um, later on our agenda this evening and during council member comments, but um, given we have a number of speakers signed up to address the council tonight. I would like to um, get on with our, our agenda, but I'm, I'm sure there will be um, comments and questions from the council as we proceed uh, this evening. Um, prior to getting into that, um, in reviewing the, the order of the speakers and the agenda this evening, um, I, and the number of public hearings that we have scheduled for tonight. I would like, with the council's permission, to take the agenda out of order and do non-ordinance action items two and three um, immediately following the 
speakers, and then we will do the consent agenda and then move on um, with the rest of the agenda as, um, as it is uh, presented. So um, we would need a motion to take the council agenda out of order. Um, and so I moved. would, okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay, Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Rosas? Here. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Lucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes, sorry. Mayor Weir? Yes. Thank you. I just think it'll make the meeting run a little bit smoother as I was trying to organize this. Uh, so now we will uh, get on with our speakers. The first is Beth uh, Franklin, who requests to speak to the council regarding the Square Streetscape project. Ms. Franklin. Beth, you're muted. There you go. Sorry, this use of feet. Okay, can you see me and can you hear me? That's the hardest part of the whole thing. I can see you, but can barely hear you. Madam Mayor, I'm sorry, but I cannot hear her. Beth, would okay. you maybe try to call back in on your phone? Sure. And then we can hear you. I mean, we might not be able to see you, but we might be able to hear you better. Let me so let me move on to Michael Baxley and I'll come back to you. Okay. I'll do okay. That. All right. Michael uh, Baxley requests to speak to the council regarding the importance of the Truman Connected Project, the Englewood Arts and the Englewood Arts District. Mr. Baxley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Uh, my name is Michael Baxley. I'm the director of Inglewood Arts, a fairly new nonprofit formed in the Inglewood District. Um, I'm here today to give my endorsement of the Truman Connected Project uh, on behalf of Inglewood Arts. I just wanted to uh, point out to the council a few key things and then I'll uh, sign off. But um, having reviewed this project, we think this is a real, uh, very important lifeline for independence. Um, the project, this project will improve the lives of current residents as well as making it, making it more attractive for new residents by making it more accessible and attractive uh, in these areas between Inglewood, the stadium, um, the square, and the library. Um, there's been significant improvement to the square. Uh, as we know that there's been over $30 million raised for improvements to the library. And Inglewood has received, uh, with the help of this uh, city, many improvements in the sidewalks and the sewer systems. And our nonprofits focused on the renovation of the former medical building to be a new art center. Um, with this investments, it seems very logical that this Truman Connected project would bring all of these wonderful things together in a more harmonious independence. Um, we're, I just wanted to point out that efforts have already been underway through uh, several community leaders, thanks to Cindy McLean uh, and Tammy Parsons, 
they recently put together uh, with many others uh, a project called Ch uh, Chalk the Walk, which was designed to connect Inglewood to the square. Um, and then also Tammy Parsons and many other community members have been putting together an effort called Heart to Heart, which hopefully many of you have noticed the hearts that connect uh, Inglewood to the square and the go around the square. Uh, that's a fundraiser, fundraising effort for the West End Connection. Uh, but there's already efforts going to how do we bring unity to independence? How do we bring uh, people together in, in these significant areas? And it seems that the Truman Connected project is really an ideal and logical next step for independence. So uh, with the investments that's gone into all three or four key locations, uh, we think that the Truman Connected project will really bring it home. And I just wanted to give my endorsement for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Beth, do we have you back? Okay, we'll move to um, our next speaker, which is Bill Moore, request to speak to the council regarding the moratorium on new apartment development approvals. Mr. Moore. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Bill Moore, and I am a longtime resident of the City of Independence. I am also an attorney with Rouse Frets White Goss Gentle Roads, representing Crackerneck Creek LLC, the owners of the falls at Crackerneck Creek Development, which we all refer to as the Bass Pro Project. I also represent Case and Associates Properties, Inc., the developer of the proposed 275-unit apartment project proposed to be located within the falls of Crackerneck Creek. I am here this evening to speak against the adoption of resolution number 21-717, a proposed 15-month moratorium on any new apartment permit applications. I am not here tonight to argue the merits of this particular apartment project. That debate will occur before you on April 5th, when the matter is scheduled for a first reading and a public hearing. Your vote on this case is currently set for April 19th. My clients have been working and investing significant dollars and time to get this matter before you in April. For example, Case has already invested over $250,000 in this project and several months of time. This is a complex matter, not just a land use case although it should be treated as such. It also involves the need to amend the Crackerneck Creek Tax Increment Financing Plan, even though no incentives are being sought to build the project. Why is this important, you may ask? For over 15 years, the owners, Crackerneck Creek LLC, have turned away developers seeking to build multifamily housing because the approved TIF plan does not allow for that use. However, in the past year, conversations have occurred with city representatives about amending the TIF plan to permit a high quality apartment development such as is proposed. Knowing that the amendment still needed to occur, the owners began to listen to proposals. Case and Associates Properties Inc. from Tulsa, Oklahoma presented an outstanding proposal. It was especially exciting because they were not currently in the Kansas City market and they were not seeking any tax incentives. All of this was occurring with the full knowledge of the city. As I mentioned, a major financial investment was made. Both Crackerneck Creek LLC and Case, being sophisticated developers, understood the risks that they were taking. Those are normal risks in the development world. What nobody envisioned was that near the end of the approval process, the rug would be pulled out from underneath them. If the intent of resolution number 21-717 is to prevent my client from completing the process that has not only begun, but is near the end of the process, then I would suggest to you that it is not only unfair, but it is unconscionable. Knowing full well that this project was in the pipeline, to wait until the 11th hour to pull the plug will send a resounding message to the, to the development community stay away from independence. I've spoken with seven of you, several of you regarding resolution 2117 
and to a person, I was told that this resolution was not aimed at this project. So with that said, I urge you to amend resolution 717 to clearly state that this project may proceed. To do otherwise, we'll send the wrong message to the development community, a signal the city of independence cannot afford. Therefore, I strongly urge you to either vote no on resolution 2117 as it is currently drafted or amend the resolution and allow my client's project to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Beth Franklin is back. So we will go back to Ms. Franklin to speak on the, to the council regarding the Square Streetscape project. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Uh, good. I'm on a, I've got a different computer, and I just this is the new one. This must be much better. So sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself again. I am here representing the Independence Chamber of Commerce. I'm the chair of the board of directors this year. I'm going to read my statement if you don't mind. Um, last year, the Chamber of Commerce board of directors heard a presentation on this square streetscape project, which is a tongue twister for me. I apologize. And we endorsed the project at that time. The square represents one of the most unique business dis districts, not only in Independence, but the entire metro area. How many areas can claim the history that our square has? It is a focal point for out-of-town visitors who come to explore the history of President Truman, and that journey is not complete until they've taken in the square. In many instances, it is the impression that visitors leave with, and tonight we have an opportunity to enhance that impression. The square streetscape plan has been years in the making. Previous citizen surveys show that 90% of residents say the enhancement of the square should be a community priority, which is why it was included in the Independence for All strategic plan. It is one of the five priorities that the chamber brought to the city council in 2017. And tonight you have an opportunity to check this one off the list. The cost of this project is substantial, but being able to leverage federal funds, which will cover 46% of the project, is an opportunity we may not get again. The improvements being made are not only aesthetic, but just as important is what's happening below the surface with the updates to the water and stormwater systems, which are well past their usable life. It will guarantee that the square will be able to be enjoyed for many generations to come. In a day and age when we are seeing the downsizing and eliminating of the big box stores, the square provides us with those one-of-a-kind retail ex experiences that we will need for our local economy to survive and thrive. Ultimately, the connection to the Truman Library and Inglewood will enhance the economic viability in all of these areas. So just as the Chamber Board gave their endorsement to this project, I encourage you to give your support to this project with your vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mike Kopic, who requests to speak to the council regarding suspension of the rental ready program. Mr. Kopic. Okay, thank you, Mayor Weir and council members. Um, I wanted to discuss the suspension a little bit. I know that there were two issues that were listed there. One being COVID, that's something that I wanted to specifically address. Obviously that's been a concern for a year now. Um, and Seems, seems a little late in the game to be doing a whole lot as numbers are going down. But what we do, and, and one of the things as a rental ready inspector, um, I kind of wanted to give you the boots on the ground, <laughs> what we're doing. Um, obviously, we've got the mask, we've got the hand sanitizer that I carry with me, we've got, you know, all those things. Distancing um, is, is, you know, something that obviously is very easy to do um, in the homes. Um, you know, it's fairly short inspection. So, you know, we're taking all those steps. If there has been a big concern, um, I had one that the tenant was in their 80s, had health issues, things like that. We had the grandson did a FaceTime with me. Um, and I know um, I've talked to a couple of the other inspectors that we've done that, 
you know, if needed, if somebody's and that way, you know, they've got somebody that's in the household that I can say, push the test button or shake that or show me that, you know. So we're able to, to really work with that. If somebody's quarantined, we've been able to call Perry and say, hey, these inspections are going to be a little late because they need a couple of weeks to deal with this. Um, so, you know, we've been very cognizant of that. Um, obviously, the next thing that was listed is the um, financial impact of landlords. Um, and I understand that $50 is still $50. At the same time, for a safety program, that's $50 every two years. So roughly $2 a month is not a whole lot for a safety program. And certainly as a business owner, I know that, you know, that that's, wouldn't be my largest thing. But the thing that I want to make sure that we keep in mind is that it's a safety program. And while COVID and all those things um, have an impact, um, we're having an impact on the city and the residents of the city and the safety in the city. Um, you know, I had a little handout that hopefully they put in your box. Um, it started out addressing this and then just kind of morphed into my feedback on the whole program. But one of the things I want to point out is in the last few days, um, I put in nine smoke detectors. Today I had one house that had no working batteries in any. I put um, you know, five batteries, a carbon monoxide detector, um, all of those. Um, I found two houses that didn't have adequate heat. Um, and a lot of it, I think people look at the landlords and how they're taking care of things. Part of what we do isn't as much the landlords. There's a lot of things that are not reported to a landlord, either for tenant fear. Um, it could be that they just don't want to deal with the maintenance person. They don't and a lot of tenants don't think about things like smoke detectors, stuff like that. So we're providing this service as an ongoing thing um, that, that helps the tenants. And a lot of times that's the thing that we're working with is the tenants more than just the landlords. Um, and obviously a lot of our landlords do a really good job. However, you know, we're here for the ones that don't necessarily, or the tenants that aren't paying attention. Um, you know, the ones that didn't have heat both of those were able to get resolved quickly. Both of them hadn't been reported to the landlord. We were able to get a hold of the landlord, get it fixed, get, get things back on track for each sentence. So those are things that are very important now. Um, while COVID is a concern, so are smoke detectors, carbon monoxide. I mean, safety is what we're doing. Um, not only that, but suspending it, because I could see that being a logistical nightmare trying to catch up. Um, Perry, bless his heart, does a wonderful job of trying to keep caught up. But as those multiply, um, all of a sudden we're going to have all of those coming due. Um, so I'm concerned about the safety things that we'd be missing, as well as just the logistics of being able to catch back up with that. So we have one minute. All right, super. I will leave it there because I think I put most of the things in writing. Um, feel free to reach out to me if anybody wants to discuss the program or the input, um, feel free to do that. The last thing that I do want to, was that my time? <laughs> you can finish, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say the last thing that I do want to say is if you're looking over the um, input and the inspections as are put in the city um, system, a lot of times those are not an accurate representation because I know all of us carry smoke detectors, batteries, junction box covers, we're showing up to houses that would not pass. However, at the point that we put them in the system, they do pass because we're taking care of those types of things on site so that they do pass and the tenants are safe then um, and, and getting it taken care of. So just because you're not seeing a lot of fails in the system doesn't mean that they were that way when we arrived at the house. Thank, thank you. you for, all right, thank, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is J.D. Kerman, who requests to speak to the council regarding the Square Streetscape project and the moratorium on new apartment development approvals. Mr. Kerman. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. I trust you can hear me okay. Thank you very much. I want to uh, uh, begin by talking about the Square Streetscape project. I won't try to be more uh, eloquent than Beth. However, this is also something that the EDC board has been supporting since its very uh, inception. It's an important initiative, and I recently sat through a presentation with Councilman Perkins, and at the end of that presentation, the EDC board moved to uh, throw its support behind this important project. 
I want to mention that this is not just a uh, project that demonstrates a willingness to invest inside independence and a, and, a, and a willingness to invest in the infrastructure that these businesses rely on, but it also enhances the environment in such a way that makes people think, wow, you know, independence has got real vitality. And we all want the story of independence when we bring somebody here, whether it's a new prospect or a family member, we all want to start downtown. And, and, and this is a great step in that direction. Obviously, the coordination on a project like this in, in an older uh, um, commercial area with all the subterranean issues that you have with stormwater and things of that nature, it's a big project, but it's an important one. And we're, we're, we're very proud to support it. Moving on to the um, apartment construction moratorium and the housing study, I'd like it to take a little bit different approach on this and tell you that the EDC would welcome and support a housing study. This would be a tremendous tool for us because when when we have conversations with people about uh, the, these sorts of uh, ultra dense developments, right? When when we're increasing the density or or simply doing a project in an area that's already zoned for that kind of density, uh, issues are going to arise, and reasonable people are going to disagree on those issues. So a housing study is a great place for me and my team to start because it allows me to kind of mitigate some of these issues before they. Uh, they hit the front page of the paper or the city council chambers or something like that. So we would be very much in support of the housing study. You heard from someone far more qualified than me tonight regarding the moratorium. I would just ask that if you find that to be absolutely necessary, that you reach out to the EDC and, and we're ready to assist. And I think many of the other stakeholders would feel the same way. Let's get that housing study done and let's get it implemented so that we uh, can make sure that the moratorium doesn't last any longer than it must absolutely have to. So. That's a tough question that y'all are uh, wrestling with, and, and, and I appreciate the fact that you're willing to take it on. Uh, your support of the EDC is appreciated, and um, we are ready to stand by and help with that study at, 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 at your beck and call. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Amanda Tilton, who requests to speak to the council regarding the Rental Ready Program. Mrs. Tilton. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I'm Amanda Milton. I am the owner of Square One Homes. I'm a landlord in Independence. I'm also a registered nurse. I wanted to speak to you guys tonight about the Rental Ready Program. Um, I became aware of this issue because our business license is up for renewal and we are not able to renew our license because although all of our properties have had an initial inspection, the inspections are not current. So we're not able to renew our license at this point. Um, I don't feel comfortable sending an inspector or our maintenance people into our tenants' homes at this point due to COVID. Um, I think we've pushed inspections back because we're in a state of emergency and we didn't feel like it was safe. I feel like that's evidence that we don't feel like it's safe for us to meet in person tonight, that we're on a Teams meeting rather than sitting in person talking. Um, I think I am concerned about my tenant's safety. I don't feel like I should be able to force an inspector or my maintenance people to go into their homes unwelcomed simply so that I can get my business license. And we're at a point right now where we're so close to everyone being able to have access to the vaccine. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to be vaccinated because I am a nurse, but many of our tenants do not have that access right now. And I don't feel like it's my place to be able to tell them I have to have somebody come into your home. Or even if they're able to do a virtual inspection, which I think is a great thing, but if there's a small issue that comes up and then we have to send our maintenance man in, when it's an issue that they're not concerned about, that's not an eminent safety issue, I don't feel good about sending them in for that. And I, I appreciate the inspector that spoke earlier. And I wanna be clear, like I, as a small business owner, I have no interest in hurting small businesses more than they've already been hurt in the last year. And I'm happy to come up with an alternative if there would be some kind of option where we could even pay for the inspection now, but have the inspection done after people have access to vaccines. I think that would be very reasonable. Um, and I just wanna be clear that my purpose in speaking is not at all in protest of the Rent Ready program or even in the inspections. It's simply a safety issue for both my tenants, all the tenants in Independence and our maintenance staff. 
I'm happy to answer any questions or talk more in detail, but that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, we do have another speaker who signed up late, um, who was not printed on our agenda. That is Jeff Rogers, who um, wishes to speak to the council regarding the square streetscape. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Hi, I'm Jeff Rogers, a resident of Independence and uh, acting executive director of the Square Association. I just wanted to um, to bring to the council's attention uh, the support that um, our partnerships uh, of the Square Association have for this project. We're uh, excited about the possibility. Um, there's over 1,700 people who are employed within our historic downtown. Uh, we have over 100,000 tourists that annually visit our downtown and we're expecting significant growth as the Truman Library comes back online this year. Um, and that doesn't include the numbers of the fairs and festivals that occur in the downtown, the annual parades. Um, we've become a placemaking space for summer outdoor movies and bicycle rides, um, uptown market activities. So not just tourists, but for our, our citizens alike. Uh, this is a way to, to care for our historic assets by framing them in the best possible way. We're already working with a, a local artist to add additional statuary that will help tell more of the story of President Truman from his first job as a youth to his military experience. Um, so that additional art that's going to be added, it would really be nice to be able to place that in a, um, an area where we know that uh, it, it looks in its best light. And we also know that the infrastructure there is, is set to, to uh, be in place for decades to come. We do have funding mechanisms in place to help care for ongoing ma maintenance and public amenities in the district now. Uh, we've got the people in place to organize the continuing care of plannings, benches, artwork, uh, trash collection, et cetera. Um, so acting on this now will not only uh, allow the share to reduce costs uh, when combined with the Truman Connect project, but it also creates a, a consistent design and, and will help capitalize on the increased traffic from the renovated library and the new National Park Service location. Um, this investment will yield increased tax collection through longer visits by tourists, renewed regional interests in our area, and increased investment in properties by uh, the current um, building owners in our district. And it will demonstrate that we're not neglecting our role as caretakers of our history. Um, the hometown of a president, the trailhead of westward expansion, let's show our pride by investing in our past and our present, um, keeping our downtown a place where where tourists want to spend time, where businesses locate, and where citizens will continue to gather for music parades, entertainment, or just well-lit, safe strolls through the past and into the future. I appreciate your time this evening. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our speakers who have signed up in advance. Is there anyone present who would like to address the council this evening? Okay. Hearing none, we will now take up um, non-ordinance action item number two. Adam, please work. So number 217, a resolution directing city manager to review the city's rental ready interior inspection program for compliance with current public health guidelines and make recommendations to temporarily suspend and or modify this program as needed. Okay, is there discussion on this item? Madam Mayor? Yes, Councilmember DeLucy. I didn't know that we had a problem with the rental ready um, program. I think it will be a problem if we suspend the program. I think it would be a problem if Council Member Huff votes on the program. He is a council member who owns rental properties. I don't think it's appropriate that he even brought this forward. I, it's a funny thing because I'm against the rental ready program. I think it's an invasion of privacy. But to just simply suspend it because one or two people don't want to have the inspection when I was sold on this project and the citizens were sold on the project that it's a safety issue, I don't believe it's very good politics and it's not very good governance. I'm going to be voting against the resolution and I can't believe that. Mayor Ware? Yes, Councilmember Huff. First of all, um... I'm not included in that at this point. Mine is not until June. 
far as uh, my rental house is number one, but if I'm confined and can't vote or bring anything up to this council that I'm not part of, I mean, I'm in all kinds of businesses. That doesn't mean it's a conflict of interest. Uh, this thing also does not suspend it. What it says, if you read the language on there, it says for the city, it says asking the city manager to look at it and modify up to It doesn't say it, that's a city manager to give us some as far as uh, this resolution. It's not, it says apply or stand up to the city manager to come back with something. We're not voting on to suspend this at this point. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilmember. Well, I, I think there's a great deal of confusion surrounding what the, the purpose of this is. and. Um, so let's, let's just get down to brass tacks. It's, I've had, um, several, uh, property owners call me concerned about the liability issues of the city requiring inspectors to come into, um, rental units, uh, during a time where, uh, COVID has created a lot of uh, lockdowns and just a lot of insecurity surrounding individuals coming from the outside in. Uh, I have one uh, property owner who uh, had uh, complied uh, with the program and as a result um, shortly after the inspector was inside the home the tenant came down with COVID and claimed that he got COVID from the inspector and, and was threatening to sue uh, everyone involved. And, and that's concerning. Um, I know that, uh, with the city, uh, with things like the black, the backflow, uh, preventer valve inspections or, or testing that we do. Um, I didn't want anybody in my home during the, the summer months early on, um, for fear of, of, uh, not knowing where they'd been, who they'd been around. It was, it's it's just a liability issue that that I think uh, that the city should be concerned about that uh, property owners definitely need to be concerned about and and as well the uh, inspectors need to be concerned about so what we're just trying to do is simplify we're not asking for suspension of the program we're just asking that the in the interior inspection portion be suspended or modified. Uh, and, and allow the inspectors to do an exterior uh, inspection for the windows and anything that's unsafe or looks like it needs to be addressed. If we receive complaints about interior issues, then of course uh, we have to work through a process to get an inspector in. So it's, it's more about protecting uh, property owners uh, who happen to be constituents, who have made investment in this city, who understand the liabilities associated with it and i i think it's a, a a smart move i think it's a good move during a state of emergency to try to help uh secure and protect people's investments and uh, without it uh, exposing our community to any unnecessary risk so that's why we put it together and i i'll be in support of this um did everybody mute their microphones if they're not speaking? We're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, I appreciate Mrs. Tilton coming today, and I think that she made um, some very outstanding points from a variety of perspectives and um, things that, frankly, I had not considered or had occurred to me. I absolutely love this program. I believe in this program. It was a long time coming and went through a number of variations to arrive at where we did in 2017. Um, and I have lived with this program through all of those from the first day that I was elected to the city council. This has been something that was being discussed, that was being promoted by Mayor Reimel. 
um, was not able to get that to completion, but something that I know that he cared deeply about as well. And I'm proud that we were able to come up with a program for independence. And quite honestly, um, as controversial as it was, and it certainly was controversial, it's become a model for many cities around us who are seeking to do um, similar things. Um, so I'm proud of what we've done. But I also know from being involved with the process for as long as I have that um, we discussed in great detail giving a, you know, doing something for the, the landlords who continually proved that they could pass the, um, the inspections, who demonstrated that level of responsibility. That did not go into the original ordinance that created this program. We felt at the time in developing this that we should get this program up and running, see how it went, somewhat on a trial basis. Um, but I think, you know, at this point in time, after all of these years, I, I do think that it's time, COVID or no COVID, to review the program and, and like we do with many things and see if it still is um, serving its purpose. One of the purposes was to identify the landlords in our, in our city and we identified hundreds of landlords who previously were unregistered um, for a variety of reasons and that in itself was a huge accomplishment. I talk with Mr. Kofik, you know, frequently um, about this program. He's made outstanding comments this evening that I think are very important about how our inspectors treat this. And they go in there, I mean, they just take their batteries and put them in the smoke alarms, make help people be compliant, um, take care of a number of other issues when they can. They install smoke detectors. Uh, really go above and beyond. Um, I think it's people, important for people to remember these are private businesses that we contract with. This isn't the city coming into your house. These are approved contractors um, for the city. Um, I am comfortable this evening supporting this to review it and, and, and do recommendations. I will not support a suspension of the, or elimination of the program. Um, I think it's very important for our city. It's something that has been incredibly successful for our city, um, that landlords, even though they, uh, many who expressed initial discomfort with this program have come to embrace the program and um, safety always has to be first and foremost. Um, I, I'm impressed that um, Mr. Kopik, you know, mentioned that he's been able to do some FaceTime inspections. Um, I think there's some innovation there that given the circumstances. Um, so I'm happy to support this, uh, this item to ask the city manager to review this and see if there's some things that we need to do um, in light of the pandemic, which we hope is, you know, certainly improving and hopefully getting us back to some semblance of normal. But I want to be clear with everybody in the community, I will do everything to preserve this program um, because I feel that it's that important and it has been that, that successful. Are there any other comments? Yes, Councilman Hobart. Um. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated Mike uh, Kopik putting in the time and effort not only to speak to us, but to provide the detailed uh, document that he drafted and, and put in our boxes. Um, the 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 stories of the two families that your program helped get heat when they were too afraid or too unknowing to tell their landlords was uh, particularly moving and having uh, worked in law for so long, I've, I've been on both sides of evictions before. And um, I just, I just know that there are a lot of people out there that 
rent that don't have a lot of money and don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about how how it works between a tenant and landlord. So I um, uh, additionally, I don't know why if a program's been so successful, we need to all of a sudden review it. I'm I'm in favor of keeping it as is, and I'll be voting against this resolution. Madam Mayor. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, John. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you see me now? Yes. So I'm like you, I'm in favor to review and modify where it need be, but not in favor of, of suspending or, or replacing this program with, with something completely different or eliminating the program. So I'll vote yes to, to look and review and, and have discussions when this is brought back to the council, but not in favor of suspending uh, this at all. Okay, is there any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman Huff. Yes, uh, Mr. City Manager, do we have a attorney here this evening? Yes, sir. Um, I know that uh, Mitch uh, Langsford is on, and I believe Shannon Marcano, the city attorney, is also with us. I would like to ask him if it's a conflict of interest for me to vote on this. Uh, Shannon, could you weigh in on that? Yes, I don't feel like I have a complete amount of information to be able to talk about the program itself, but if the resolution is just directing the review of the program by the city manager, it sounds to me like everybody on the council can vote on it. I think should there be a substantive resolution that effect, affects the operation of the program, that might be a different matter. But again, additional information would be needed before we could make a definitive uh, uh, um, determination on that. I just wonder because my livelihood, that's part of my livelihood, and I guess that there's a couple of attorneys that's on this council that shouldn't be practicing law in the city of Independence because that's probably a conflict of interest for them. This is my livelihood and I should have that. Uh, I've had them properties a long, long time. They've been practicing a long time. I hope they don't uh, get in front of our independence judges because that'd be a conflict of interest if we're going to stretch it that far. But that's fine. Uh, that's all I have to say. Okay, are there any other comments? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council members, huh? Definitely, yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Lucy? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, item number two passes. Um, next up is item number three, Councilman Steinmeier. Uh, Madam Mayor, we have um, put together uh, a uh, part of the resolution that I wanted to bring forward was due to um, just my concern that we are um, seeming to be saturating our city with uh, multifamily units. Uh, back in June, I do recall, I believe it was Councilmember DeLucci who, uh, upon approval of the last multifamily unit, uh, she indicated that we needed to do this one, and this was it for a while. Now, we don't know how long a while is, but I was in a, a total agreement with her. I think that our efforts should be directed more towards single-family dwellings and the development of new, uh, new developments, new homes and be attractive to uh, um, folks and families that want to come in and establish themselves. So all I would like to do is, is uh, have a pause and, and have some direction uh, based on information. Information helps us get to, to a place of, of making good decisions. I've talked with council member Perkins and Huff and had uh, conversations with uh, uh, you, Madam Mayor, regarding um, what what we think we can do to keep uh, the focus on, which is to uh, get a good plan to move uh, our our city forward uh, in the long term for community development, and and uh, we felt like if we uh, modified this uh, or amended the motion, that uh, possibly it would be more palatable. So. Um, 
can I make a, a, a motion to amend or do we want to have more discussion first, Madam Mayor? Um, you may make your motion to amend. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, move to exclude all family development projects currently scheduled for consideration by any city board or commission of the, uh, or the city council, including any applications currently pending, referral to uh, any city board or commission or the city council, and uh, to direct the city manager to have our city management anal analysts to develop a comprehensive housing study uh, to be uh, brought back to the council uh, by March 31st, 2021. Uh, if possible. So, Mr. Councilman Steinmeier, let yes. me jump in just a moment on your motion. Yes. The city manager does not direct the management analyst. Oh. The council directs us. Okay. The analyst. So, if we would like to bring that forward um, for to the management analyst, we'll we submit that to the audit committee, and then okay. they um, th they will handle that. So, I would just make that. I would eliminate that from your motion. Okay. Um, Thank you for the clarification. Um, so there is a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Yes. Been moved and seconded. Um, is there a discussion on the motion? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilmember DeLucy. So are what we what we're voting on is a future moratorium. Anything that's not already in the pipeline is excluded. Is that is that the motion now? Um, my understanding, Councilman Steinmeier, your motion is anything that is currently underway would um, not be interrupted. Um, that we would proceed immediately with a housing study. Um, how do you treat in then the moratorium? Would that be for anybody who is not? that we would not consider any new projects until the completion of a housing study? I would say, yes, I would, I would say that it would be, um, that, you know, it could be up to a period of time uh, until we have the housing study in front of us and then we can revisit the moratorium once we have information to make a good informed decision on what to do next. And Madam Mayor, and then I am going to speak to this. Um, in the past five years, we've approved two things, two apartment complexes. I don't know what is in the future because I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't want to shut anybody down if they want to come to Independence with a really great project. I don't want them to hear, well, they're not even going to look at your project. Go away. And that's what a moratorium does. I don't know who would do the housing study. I don't know where the money would come from for the housing study. I don't know how long it would take to do a housing study. And I don't exactly know the scope of the housing study. I personally think we have an awful lot of apartments in independence. I believe it approaches 40%. So it's not that I don't have a lot of compassion for where Mr. Steinmeier is going. I just think we are painting with too broad a brush to tell unknown people don't bother to come. Now, I absolutely didn't like the original motion where we were shutting somebody down after they have already entered the pipeline and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know that we need a moratorium to do a housing study. We can do a housing study without a moratorium. And therefore, I'll be voting against this motion in both ways it's written. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Who? Councilman Hobart? I just I just wanted to add that, um, Madam Mayor, you and I both had some initial discussions on a project that that would be, I think we I think we both agreed would be a really great uh, addition to the for the fourth district. Um, to use some vacant property and and do some affordable senior housing and uh, but it's technically multi-family or apartment dwellings. They're they're beautiful. They're great, but uh, I I can't uh, I just don't understand. There's no data to support 
support this resolution that I just, I don't understand and I don't want to cut people off from uh, what could be really good projects. So I'll have to vote no. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman Sunday. Without a study asking specific questions to the future and direction of our city, you will have no data. That's just how it works. We have to ask the questions. We have to do the research. And we need to do it from many different perspectives. Um, Mr. City Manager, you you are had said in the resolution that we have over 9,900 multifamily units uh, currently in Independence. Is that correct? Yeah, I pulled that. That number is probably a little dated. I got that from um, U.S. Census Bureau uh, most recent report, which was the 2018 estimate, but. Um, there's probably a decent amount of validity to that. Pretty, probably a pretty close number. And then we have another 520 uh, getting ready to come online with the new construction. Yes, sir. So that's going to put us over 10,000 multifamily units. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I don't know if anybody else uh, looked at the project um, laid out by Case and Associates, but if you look at what they're asking for in, in terms of rent and the qualification of uh, three to five times the income to support those rents to qualify, you will find that we're gonna have a lot of empty units based on those qualifications. We have to ask ourselves what are what is going to attract the folks that have this type of income levels to come into our community and wanna be here. Um, we need to look at this from the standpoint of not just community development, but capital investments. We need to look at it, and I would think every one of us would be concerned about our real estate values um, in our city and, and uh, you know, protecting those assets. So there's a lot that we need to know. If you want data, then we need a study, and, that, and that's, that's what we're lacking. We're just approving things and we we approved the last project and i and i'm i have no problem reminding council member delucci that she said we need to put this needs to be the last one for a while that we just needed to kind of put a pause on this and i agree and the data should have been we probably should have been asking for the study back then but it didn't happen with the old council so this is all i'm asking for let's go ahead and let it pass through if you don't like the time frame, that's fine. Get the study. Let's go through it. Let's have a study session. Let's get a comprehensive plan to move this city forward that's attractive at many different uh, levels, and, and let's grow our city the right way. That's all I Mad have. Madam Mayor? Yes, Councilmember Blue I just want to say I spoke with Mr. Uh, Moore a couple days ago, and I told him, please do not think because I don't support this resolution, that I support your project. I think we have an awful lot of apartments in Independence. What we're voting on tonight is a moratorium. It is a stop sign. It is a do not come into Independence, anybody. Don't look at us anymore. That's what I'm opposed to. I want to have a housing study. I've wanted it for a couple of years. But we don't need to do a moratorium to have a housing study. Thank you. Adam Mayor. So, Adam Mayor. oh, yes, Councilman Hoff. I just wanted to go over that. Uh, you've been asking for a housing study, and I think uh, Councilman DeLucci voted no, and a few others around here. I know that you've been after it for quite a few years. We've heard JD tonight say this is very, very important. It seems like we have to do stuff like this uh, kind of a backwards way to get anything done around here because we just want to do uh, weekend studies and then come up with these solutions. Uh, this this study is very, very important to this city, has been for a long time, and you have mentioned it. I've heard it from the city manager, quite a few people. And so this is kind of just kind of just ramp, ramping it up there so we can get this study done. I guarantee that we can get this study done a lot quicker if everybody agrees that we need to get the moratorium going so it'll push it a little quicker. Um, let me, I, you know, I'm 
<laughs> I'm struggling with this one, to be quite honest with you. I, um, as Councilman Huff pointed out, I've been, I've been pushing for a housing study for a number of years since we completed the comprehensive development plan. We did not include housing um, in that particular plan, and it became glaringly obvious that we needed a housing study. Um, so I, you know, would ask for that to be included in the budget and it would always be removed. Um, so I'm glad that there is now interest and support for proceeding with the study. When I look around our city and other cities, absent a plan, you end up getting a lot of what you may not want. Um, and, you know, if it's zoned a certain way and they're not seeking incentives, things can, you know, just show up that we don't have any say over. Um, and without a study and a, and a policy and a plan, then we don't have any way to prevent the type of um, growth and development that we, that I say we, I mean the community, I don't mean the city council that the community envisions. Um, they create a great vision with the comprehensive development plan, and we need to create that same vision for the housing strategy. Um, and just tearing stuff down without, without a plan of what to put up in it, its place isn't a strategy. Um, so I, I support the intent of it. I certainly am pleased you know, to support the motion that would exclude anybody who is currently in any form of a process. As Councilman Hobart pointed out, um, he and I are working with a developer who has purchased property in the fourth district and they're seeking tax credits from the state. They didn't receive them on their first application, but they intend to go back. And I don't wanna halt their progress because that would be a great addition to this neighborhood. Um, so, um, I'm not sure that the management analyst has the capability um, with resources that we have to do the type of housing study that we need. Um, I think that's a great place to start, to help us start getting our arms around it. When we did the comp plan, it was a full year of work by our community development department and our internal departments. And then probably another almost year of community engagement. I mean, that's a bigger thing than what we're talking about. Um, so I'm comfortable with certainly moving the housing study to the forefront and under, starting to understand what that would entail, the scope, the cost, the participation from organizations like the EDC and, and the chamber and the community. Um, I don't like the word moratorium. It doesn't sound good on the ears of developers who are looking to do <laughs> work in our community. It, um, but I think that if we could just, if we could say, um, but I also understand that the plan could take some time and some development that we, this community doesn't desire could occur during that time is concerning. Um, as you know, several people have pointed out, getting your first project is hard. And after that, sometimes they just start coming. And you know, if we don't have a mechanism to be able to review and look at those, um, I think that that is concerning. So I understand the intent. What I might suggest is that we um, add to the I, um, to this bill that the city council will um, until the time where we have a housing study um, in place that we will review all permits that are pulled for residential development um, and that would allow us some additional control that we don't currently have. Um, to look at those and if need be, um, to see if they fit with our vision, with our strategic plan. Um, and 
that we would um, have the ability to deny those permits um, in instances where we would have concern about the type of development and the location of that development. Um, so I would make that motion that we would, in order, in lieu of a moratorium, that we would give the council additional oversight over all residential permits. So is there no second for that or are you thinking? <laughs> Madam Mayor. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking before movement is made on your motion, is it possible to have clarification for section one of the res of the resolution from the city manager? Would that be appropriate at this time? Yes. So under section one, the city manager is directed to implement a temporary morator moratorium of up to one year on approval of any new apartment permit applications unless approved by the council. So is that one of the safeguards that we will have in this that would allow the council to review if there's any outstanding project that may come forward within this 12 month period or before the um, housing study is done? I'm, I'm thinking, throwing it out there, this isn't necessarily happening, but if there's a project over in Inglewood that says there's a mixed use development over there, would this hinder any type of mixed use development unless it was approved by the council to go forward? Um, you know, council member, I think that's how it could be read, but you could certainly amend this uh, with the vernacular that the mayor just mentioned to just put that extra additional uh, layer of caution in there so that, you know, how that is interpreted is very clear to everyone. I don't think you could err too far on putting too much language on here just to be certain uh, of the outcome you're getting. Okay. I'll second the motion on the table. Mr. City Manager? Yes. Does any other city in Eastern Jackson County have a moratorium or this extra step where a city council will have to, has to approve a permit? I, off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any cities in Eastern Jack uh, that are doing that right now, um, Councilwoman. I, I know that the cities in Johnson County are um, slowing things down a little bit right now while they do a larger um, housing studies, but I don't know the ins and outs of uh, the level of formality and approval over there. How many apartment permits have we received in the past year? Uh, I would double check with um, Tom Scannell, who I know is on the call, but I believe that is zero, other than the ones that were applied for as part of the Ainsley apartment project. Thank that, you. That's, that is relevant, and I appreciate you saying that. Do you know, Mr. City Manager, of other cities that have ha housing um, have to conduct housing studies and are oh, doing, creating housing policy. I, we're on the wrong end of this one. The, the city after city has done a housing study of some sort. So that's relevant too. And as I say, you know, two years ago, we didn't have any of this development happening. Now we have three developments, two that are under construction, one that's in the process. Um, we have conversations, I mean, informal, but, you know, Councilman Hobart and I had a, um, you know, the one in the fourth district, there's interest in housing in Englewood and mixed use in Englewood. We have a master development plan for Rockwood that would include some multifamily housing. We have spoken to several developers who are interested in potentially looking at uh, developments on the square. So just because there is an application doesn't mean there's not interest or conversation happening. Or, I mean, we were t talking about potentially some things on Nolan Road. Um, so there's there's a lot in the, in the pipeline, so to speak, that hasn't filed any paperwork with the city, but that doesn't mean they're not here looking. Um, so... I think we need a, I, I would be comfortable having 
giving ourselves temporarily a little bit more authority um, to look at these because we don't have a housing study and saying, you know, we're going to look at these permits and we can choose to take action on them or, or choose not to take action on them. But that is much more um, palatable to me and I think to the, to the development committee than, as you say, council member, putting up a stop sign and saying we're not going to let anybody in until we complete this process, which could take some time. I mean, understood. And so I think this is a nice compromise is say we're going to give ourselves a little bit more oversight to so we have a clear understanding about who's looking, who's interested. Um, and then, you know, when we complete this long overdue housing study, we will no longer require us to have that type of oversight. Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, by the time that we uh, looked at this uh, amended on Councilman Steinmeier's, uh, anyone in the pipeline would go ahead and have access and, and run their, their thing there. And now you're wanting to do away with with this moratorium, uh, you know, we're just down to, we just might take the thing off the table and say one housing study and vote on that if that's what everybody wants. Uh, this person's got to get that to, to roll here, but uh, just getting cut up bad. I mean, that's exactly what uh, Councilman Steinmeier is after is a housing study just like you, but in order to get this thing running, it's been two years. So we're going to wait two more years to see it happen unless we do something. Uh, that counters that like this, then we know that there's some action. Here. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, so <laughs> we have two motions on the table. Um, and uh, item 21717. So, Madam City Clerk. Um, I believe we need to vote on the motion to eliminate the moratorium in lieu of putting, giving the council oversight over the permitting process first. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's correct. And then we also need to go ahead and read the bill. So I'll, if it's okay, I'll read the yeah. bill and then we can do a vote on the okay. second amendment. Um, so this is for bill number 21-717, a resolution directing the city manager to implement a temporary moratorium on all new apartment development approvals within the city of Independence. So this vote will be the second amendment, which is for the council to review all permits in lieu of the moratorium. Council members Huff? No. Perkins? No. Stewart? No. DeLucy? No. Steinmeier? No. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? No. Okay. Next uh, motion. Uh, the next motion is the motion made by Councilmember Steinmeier, and this is amending it to exclude anything that's already in process and to move forward with the housing study. And if I have, a, I have a question, how long is this moratorium going to last? So how long do we think that the study will take to put together? Mr. We have no idea. That's the problem. We don't know who's going to do it. We don't know the cost. We don't know the scope. And we're looking at doing a moratorium. Thank you. I understand. Um, well, I, I understand your frustration. I too share your frustration because it would have been cheaper and we'd have been farther along had we done it back in June. So it, I'd say let's just get it done. This is a moratorium on apartment complexes. This is not a request for a housing study. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilmember Hall. Uh, uh, Councilman DeLucci, I guess what, uh, just like everything else changes around here, if uh, Councilman Hobart or Councilman Perkins comes up with something and they bring it forth, I'm sure that we can change the rules like we do all the time to approve or disapprove that project. I don't see that a moratorium is going to stop that. 
It's going to stop applications. It's going to stop people from looking at independence. That's the problem. A blanket unlimited moratorium is not going to help our citizens. Madam Mayor? Yes, yeah, This is specifically speaking to multifamily units. You want to grow your city? Let's look at attracting uh, single family development, single family development homes. We don't have much going on in this city. In fact, uh, Mr. City Manager, the last count that you could see for uh, permits pulled for single family residents and in independents, how many do we have? Less than 10. Less than 10. I'm telling you, from my perspective, a moratorium on something that is going to be in the tens of thousands uh, versus uh, finding out where our best efforts uh, and resources should go towards uh, makes the smarter move to me. So I, if we haven't had any up until recently anyway for the last year. So I understand your concern. The moratorium, we can put a I don't care if you want to put six months on it. I don't care if we want to revisit it in every quarter. I don't care. I want to do it the right way. I wish it had been done and initiated back in June, but here we are in February and we're still talking about it. It's time to act. So I would make a motion to review yeah. it quarterly. The right, the right way to do this is to listen to the experts. I'm sorry. Like Jay Hobart, I made a motion. I, my motion is to review it quarterly. So okay. do that. Is there any discussion? I guess I have another question. I don't know what an apartment is. This prevents all apartment permits. An apartment. If I have a if I have a home that I can rent out apartments in, is that going to prevent me from doing that? Or is it just for 200 unit apartments? Um, Madam Mayor, I'm gonna ask Mr. Scannell to weigh in here just to give you guys a quick rundown of the different classifications we have. Tom, are you there? I was on mute, I'm sorry about that. Hey, there you go. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, in the UDO, we have definitions of single family, two family, three, three family, and then from there it goes to multi family. So uh, I would rely on the UDO and their definitions for the definition of multi family. Mr. Scannell, this talks about apartments. It doesn't talk about multi family. Does the UDO have anything about apartments? Let me look through the UDO real quick. Yes, it does. The UDO does have a definition of apartment. Can you read that to us, please? Yes. An apartment is defined as a building containing three or more dwelling units that share common walls and or common floors or ceilings. Apartment slash condo buildings are typically served by one or more common building entrances. Councilman DeLucci, your speaker is not on. Thank you, Mr. Huff. So is a fourplex an apartment?
typically the fourplexes that uh, we see that are, are built within the KC Metro, they have individual entrances and not a common building entrance. So I would say no, that, that, uh, that a fourplex is not an apartment. Unless it has one building entrance, but if I wanted to have two entrances, it's not an apartment. Uh, within the definition, it says it can have one or more common building entrances. So if, okay. if the, the fourplex had uh, two shared entrances, then that would meet the definition of apartment. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Hobart. Did you have something you wanted to say? Probably better than a ticket break anyway, so I apologize for cutting in on you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this is an attempt to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And the city of Independence already has a black eye with commercial and industrial developers because of what happened with Van Trust. All, all this does is make us look small-minded and petty to any legit developer that would come try to talk to J.D. Kerman and make a deal or talk about coming to independence. Uh, you know, we, we've got enough problems without shooting ourselves in the foot left and right. So this literally solves nothing. And I'll be voting against it. So there's a motion on the floor to review the moratorium quarterly. Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Delisi? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. Motion passes. There's a motion on the floor um, to remove all pending projects and to um, initiate a housing study. Is there any discussion on the motion? I think there might have been a question there. Excuse me? I think I there might have been a question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is this a motion to exclude all pending projects? Yes. Okay. And to initiate, to give direction for this council to give direction on initiating a housing study. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Motion passes. Um, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll on 21717 as amended. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Galuzzi? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. Item passes. Now, back to the consent agenda. Mayor Pro Tem. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the report and recommendations of the city manager. Second. That moved and seconded. Council Member Perkins, I know you wanted to pull item one and two. Correct. Okay. Um, are there any other items that Council Member wants to pull for separate consideration? Okay, would you please call the roll on the consent agenda? Items, my, items one and two. Council Member Huff? Perkins? Yes. 
Stewart? Yes. Delisi? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Okay, Councilmember Perkins, item number one. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just with with continuity, I'm going to speak to number one and number two. Of course, we will vote on them separately, uh, mainly because um, the Truma Connected has a big impact on the Independent Square uh, design and the project moving there. Uh, before I begin, I want to uh, ask the City Clerk to reflect that Habitat for Humanity has also endorsed the program, um, the Independent Square Streetscape Project, please. With that, we'll I'm excited. That. Sorry. We can include that in the minutes. Okay. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. So I'm excited to uh, have these two projects before the council for consideration. The thought of redeveloping the square has been discussed for many years, as our speakers have said. Recently, the council adopted the downtown redevelopment plan October 15th of 2018. And this plan has been shepherded uh, by the Independence on a Roll Working Group, which includes myself, Councilman Huff, Councilman Steinmeier, Laura Dean Wiley, uh, Chamber of Commerce representative, and Dan O'Neill, the EDC representative. We've taken the uh, downtown redevelopment plan and had community engagements with the Independence Square Association, with our community partners, for the whole purpose of maximizing the historical attractiveness and of the heart of the city and to help spur economic development. This is a plan that uh, can work in conjunction with uh, Truman Library and its $30 million renovation and all the good things that are taking place around the square and around independence. The Truman Connected is, is, the, uh, is the plan that takes 20, takes the, uh, excuse me, takes Truman Library to the Truman Sports Complex. This will be the first phase. This plan is to, to connect those two points. The steering committee for this um, plan first met in July of 2019. We'd had community engagements with at the Inglewood Third Friday Art Walk with the Uptown Market at City Hall. Uh, we've talked to the community about the service need in the, the area. The whole idea is to have connectivity from our historic uh, uh, sites to our tourism sites to the emerging and, and blooming Inglewood Arts District. Um, these two projects are listed here as one and two. They're separate, but the city staff and independence on the rule uh, looked and thought it, the wisdom of having one uh, design firm look at these things since they will be working on the Independence Square uh, to help with continuity, to help with, with financing, and to help reduce risk of communication that could be jumbled between City Hall and stakeholder, stakeholders. So having this um, one design firm moving forward with this is highly important. And this is a big step moving Independence in the right direction and bringing some redevelopment back into our downtown. So with that, Madam Mayor, I will move for approval of item number one. Madam Mayor. Uh, we need a second for discussion. Second. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, I would like to ask the city manager any questions on these. Um, I know that Councilman Perkins has been uh, reactive in this, working on this for a long time. My only question I have is the financing of this. Uh, my understanding talking to you that this is at no cost, this preliminary one uh, with grants and uh, money out there that's donated. And this is no, at no cost to the citizens of the city at this point until we move to step two. Is that correct? Yeah, it, council member, it's, it's correct. Um, and I want to be very direct on this. Initially, the item you're approving tonight is using street sales tax funds to front the cost of the um, uh, design work. Um, I want to link this up with the um, uh, Truman Connect for just a minute to help make sense of this to you. Um, the idea here is that um, 
because a large portion of that Truman Connect Trail will run through the square, it made sense if we were going to do both projects to use one architect. So you have one person who's looking for economies of scale, minimizing costs, et cetera. Um, the grant dollars that will be coming to support this project coming later uh, down the road, um, we've been awarded them, but they just have not been uh, remitted yet. So funding cycles work where you get advance notice, several years notice. When those dollars come back in, they'll be used to reimburse and reappropriate to the um, dollars you're appropriating tonight to where it comes out in the wash and the citizens aren't paying for this design cost. If in a year from now, the council wants to proceed with construction, that would be a different story. That would require um, local city investment, but um, for this portion of it, ultimately the answer is no to you. Is there further discussion on the motion? Yes, Madam Mayor. I want to say that I've been a member of the Chamber of Commerce for over 30 years, and I think it's a great organization. I've never belonged to the EDC, but I think that's a great organization. I've practiced law in the square since 1980. I'm a member of the Square Association, but I also represent 117,000 people in 78 square miles. I don't just represent the 1,700 that Mr. Rogers talked about on the six square blocks of the square. This is the first step of a $3.224 million project. This $395,000 is coming from the street sales tax. That street sales tax just a few years ago was extended to become perpetual. It also was expanded and it can now cover sidewalks, curbs, and gutters. To date, none of that money has been spent on sidewalk, curbs, or gutters. I appreciate the fact that we're going to be applying to be reimbursed for the $395,000 in design work for the square streetscapes, but we haven't been approved for that reimbursement yet. We borrowed $15 million to repair our bridges, to fix our streets, to do our sidewalks, to do our gutters. And then we started with the 24 highway project. Phase one is $2.5 million more than what we anticipated. Phase two is $2.5 million more than what we anticipated. Right now we're fighting with MoDOT because we're in phase one. We don't have that extra money. We simply do not have it. And when you talk about spending only $395,000, don't worry, it'll be reimbursed. That's not number one guaranteed. And number two, we don't have $395,000 for design work for the square. And I love the square. And I love all the organization I've just talked about. We're going to use $854,000 of the Community Development Block Grants, which is half of the funding of that fund for three years. And by taking half that money, we are not doing bus routes. We're not doing any more training for jobs. We're not giving that money to the Salvation Army, to the Food Pantry, to Habitat for Humanity, or to Hillcrest. That's what this design work is going to cost. I don't know where the other money is coming from. I found out of the $3.224 million, $1.3 million more is earmarked from our street sales tax. Well, that still leaves me over a million dollars not knowing how we're going to pay for the street sales streetscape. I want to help the square but we have a lot more people. We have a lot more bridges. Look at our bridges. We need help on our bridges. We need help on our streets. We need help on our intersections. We cannot start boiling the frog with $395,000. And that's what we're gonna hear. Oh, it's not the $3 million, Karen. Don't worry about it. It's only 300 and we're gonna look at the design work and it's gonna be reimbursed. Yeah, right. That's not gonna happen. It's a mistake. And I'm sorry, I think our speakers were very elegant and they, they feel as strongly as I do, 
but I think it's a big mistake and it's a shortage to the rest of our citizens. We spent two million, three million on the farmer's market. We gave all that land away for the townhouses. We have done enough for the square right now. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes. So I just wanna say I do appreciate all the hard work that Council Member Perkins and the Honor Roll uh, Committee has put into this. Um, and I do agree that if it does pass, it probably will be a good project. However, um, I actually agree with Council Member DeLucy on this. I just think, you know, are we gonna be reimbursed? Are we not gonna be reimbursed? I don't really know. Um, it's just a lot of money to take a chance with and I will be voting no on this as well. Any further discussion? Madam Mayor, if I may, yes. just to uh, just remind the council and those, um, the whole idea of, of this downtown redevelopment committee and the on the roll committee that, that I chair now is we took 17 different plans that were sitting on the shelf doing nothing, collecting dust, and now we have a plan that was voted on by this council so we can start looking at the different needs of the city, starting with the Independence Square, going into Inglewood, moving into Fairmont. There's a lot of different areas that are moving, with some in a different pace than others. The Independence Square is now in the, the spot to where we are able to do the investment to make our city grow, to bring in tourism, to, to make the traffic and the tourism stay longer in this town, so that we can piggyback off the the stuff that the Truman Library is doing here. And also to remind that Councilwoman DeLucy also voted in favor of this downtown redevelopment plan, which has been our Bible, if you will, to keep this city moving forward. So this is the reason why that we've brought this forward. It's a community need has been in our, our, our um, uh, discussion points, has been in every discussion points that I've been into. So we're bringing this forward for consideration. So I'll be voting for it. And I appreciate the support of the council. Any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes. I am. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, I have heard from several of the uh, constituents here in the third district. Um, mixed review. Uh, I, I'll just say what what they said to me, which is uh, we've spent a lot of money in the square in the past. Um, right now, people question what we're doing on the square. Uh, I want the square to succeed, and I think all of us do. And that's why um, I'm, I'm reminded of the old saying, to whom much is given, much is required. I want to see our square opened up. I want to see the businesses thriving. I don't want it to be left to just a handful of businesses. Uh, I'm going to vote yes, because I'm, I'm curious to see how we're going to move forward. But um, I really want to see the businesses on the square and the, the square to become a vital part um, of our community, not just from the historical perspective, but from investment, uh, the businesses open and people uh, feeling like there's a reason to go there right now. And I'm hoping that this will help uh, spur some conversation and have people come up, but we need participation from all the businesses in that business community up on the square uh, to to do their part uh, in 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 this project. So, but with that, I'm going to vote yes for it. Further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Councilmember Ernst Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Councilmember Stewart? I'm sorry, no. DeLuzzi? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. I have number one passes. Councilmember Perkins, I have number two. Madam Mayor, I'll just move for approval of item number two. Second. So moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I just want to make it clear, Madam Mayor, to the citizens of Independence that only $230,000 total city money is going into this project. 
That's it. There's no more city money going into it. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? No. DeLucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Ware? Yes. I have number two passes. Um, before we get into the rest of our agenda, we need to take a five minute recess. So um, we will resume at 7.45.
and proceed with our public hearings. The first is a public hearing for the amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code relating to hauling trailers. This is a full public hearing. Mr. Scannell. I'll be uh, doing this one for time. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is uh, are Rick. Doing, are you doing all, Rick, so I know to call on you? Okay. Yeah. My name is Rick Arroyo, Assistant Community Development Director here at the city. Uh, this ordinance uh, amendment was considered by Planning Commission on January 12th. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended it in favor of this amendment. Um, what this does is clarifies language that, about how we measure hauling trailers and that it does now clarify that it includes open and closed trailers as well. Um, I have no new information to add. Okay. Um, this is a full public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak in favor of this amendment? Um, just a moment. I just want to make sure everybody was back in the meeting. Um, is there anybody wishing to speak in opposition? Are there any comments or questions from the council on the public hearing? Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 21-003, Ordinance Amending the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code Relating to Hauling Trailers. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, I'm still going to go with this. I just had a, I had a, when I read this thing, I just, I'm uh, really confused when uh, you buy a trailer it's based on the box size, not counting the tongue, but uh, I got no problem with it. We don't need trailers parked around everywhere anyway. I just found it really strange that we buy trailers by, you know, 10 by 12. It doesn't count the tongue. It's the box size or the cargo space. But other than that, that's all I had. Okay, is there any other comments or questions from the council on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Members House? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Lucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Our next public hearing is for the amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code relating to final plat recordation. This is a full public hearing. Is there anyone, um, Mr. Arroyo, we'll let you go ahead and present this. <clears throat> Thank you again. Uh, this uh, ordinance amendment was considered again on Planning Commission on January 12th. Uh, the Planning Commission did recommend in favor of this amendment. Um, what this one does is basically allows that final development plats be recorded up to a year. Currently the code um, calls for six months before they expire. And we just felt that this would better align <clears throat> excuse me, better align with other development submittals that expire after a year and give more flexibility to the applicant. Um, with that, I have no further information. Okay, thank you very much. This is a full public hearing. Is there anyone present wishing to speak in favor of this amendment? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Are there any comments or questions from the council on the public hearing? Okay, the public hearing is closed. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 21-004, an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code pertaining to final plat. Second and final reading. Is there any um, comments or questions on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Member Tuff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Lucy? Yes. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Um, 
This public hearing is for the application by David Miller requesting rezoning from C1 Neighborhood Commercial to R12 to Family Residential for the property located at 19401 East US 24 Highway. This is new information only, Mr. Arroyo. So thank you, Mayor. This is uh, again a rezoning application that was considered by Planning Commission on January 12th. Uh, Planning Commission recommended not in favor of this rezoning, and I have no new information to report. Okay. Um, is there any comments or questions from the council on the public hearing? Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I just want to state that I'm going to follow the Planning Commission's recommendation on this and vote no on this. Okay. That's it. Okay. Um, the public hearing is closed. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 21-005, an ordinance approving a rezoning from District C1 Neighborhood Commercial to District R12 Two Family Residential. East US 24 Highway in Independence, Missouri. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? No. Perkins? No. Stewart? No. DeLucy? No. Steinmeier? No. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? No. Uh, ordinance fails. Um, this takes us to non ordinance action item number one, Madam City Clerk. Bill number 21-714, a resolution directing the city manager to limit consideration of generation machinery solutions to new machinery or certified remanufactured machinery that meet certain criteria when evaluating solutions for replacement at combustion turbines. Is there a discussion on this bill? Madam Mayor. Yes, Council Member DeLucchi. I do not understand why we're telling an expert how to do his job, and that's how I look at this resolution. I think that Mr. Nail and our IPL people would not bring up bring us a bad product, and I don't think I, I need to, to tell him what exactly that is. He knows much better than me, so I don't understand why we would ever tell him and micromanage his job from this level. It just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to vote no on this non-ordinance action item. Councilman Huff? Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, I've been talking about this for years, even before I was elected, when I worked for the city of uh, Power and Light for 35 years. It's always been on my uh, list and now more so as a council member. Um, this is a very serious and should be a council's number one priority to get this thing running. Uh, we've seen as these power plants, which a uh, previous council told me, I didn't know what I was talking about, that these coal fires wouldn't affect this. And in turn, it has. The more coal fire power plants that are shut down does affect us. And uh, we've seen it with our own eyes in the last couple of days. Um, my biggest deal with this uh, resolution, number one, is that, uh, you know, we need to make sure that everyone understands peak and base load. And I, I know a few council people are having a hard time. They don't understand what the difference is. But uh, basically, uh, we need a base unit, uh, something that holds up, something that can generate. This is very, very important. Um, you know, we went down this green energy thing for years brought uh, to us, and green energy is not reliable. We've seen that uh, in Texas. Uh, you know, this is it was uh, not, not a matter of... Uh, if this was going to happen, it was when it was going to happen. Um, you know, my biggest concern here, and I've listed quite a few things um, on this, is that, uh, you know, we have a lot of upset people out there on this thing uh, with this blackout and everything. And it's due to some of the questions were, well, is this because we shut down Blue Valley? And some of the responses were, well, yeah, I don't know. Well, yes, it is a direct response. Um, we, 
went in with this Oneta, which I was very much against. I would think it was the only council member there prior to this council that voted against this. I said, you're buying an insurance policy, it doesn't pay, it's blue sky. And what I would like to know is where's our 50 megawatts that we're paying for at $2 million a year uh, that we could have used uh, to keep our city in uh, with power. You know, I, I've always talked about the energy issue, the dogwood, if we'd have bought 50 megs of dogwood, guess what? We would have had power in this city. But my biggest concern um, is that we make this a number one priority. We need to make sure that we're buying nothing but the best. We, uh, Councilman DeLucci, we are, this city is very subject and has in the past always go with low bid and not the best. And that is why this is on there. I wanna make sure that we get nothing but the best equipment. If we're gonna do this investment, we need to do this. This should have been done years ago. Most power people are 25 years ahead. We're 25 years behind. If this thing would have been in operation when it was brought to the council three years ago, we would have made an excess power if we had been generating approximately $6.5 million a day. 15 days of this, we already paid for this power plant. Everybody's worried about $100 million or whatever the number is. It's immaterial. When you're sitting in the cold with no lights, I don't care what it costs, there's all kinds of funding out there. That would have paid uh, basically half of this thing right off the get-go just in 15 days. Um, you know, my, my biggest deal other than that is the special interest groups that we have out here. Um, I've seen it through the years. Uh, they convinced the uh, city council that, all right, let's go. We need solar. We need wind. Uh, we need Oneta. We need this capacity. Uh, all these three things have failed. Then we hear, oh, you can't do rate reductions. Uh, you can't give credit back to rate payers. The rates are going to increase 20 something percent. Well, you know, I'm just actually, I'm, I'm really wondering what the, con the, the credentials of these people are that's giving all the city advice. I don't know that any of them have any, uh, it's just their opinion. Uh, I'm not an expert, I was there 35 years, but the special interest group keeps continuing to pour information to the city and the city is accepting them as experts and they are not experts, they are far from experts. Um, you know, uh, I just think that in the last few days and our citizens are gonna pay a lot of money for this little deal uh, and, and of course, they're upset also, but um, you know, I want to impress on this council how serious this is. This is nothing that we can continue to kick this can down the road. It's time to do something, and you know, this is our job, and we got to quit researching and resolving. And I just wanted to quote a council member a, a few meetings ago about, uh, you know, you can't do this all, resolve this all in a weekend. You know, this has been going on for a long time, and uh, we owe it to. Uh, those elected uh, who elected us to make this our highest priority. Thank you. Um, um, I concur with Councilman Hopp. I, I've seen the city over the years um, purchase, make purchases of equipment, vehicles, fire equipment, facilities that were not of the highest standard and cost cutting has to occur from time to time this i have the utmost confidence in our city manager and his professional staff to, to make sound decisions on behalf of our council but we are here to direct them and that is our job and that is our responsibility so um i certainly understand in specific to this resolution about why um, it may be appropriate to buy refurbished equipment, but it has to meet a, a, a standard and a delivery time. We know all over this country, the pipeline it, and uh, is very slow right now for all types of things. So we have no idea, you know, when this, it comes time to make these decisions, what the availability of equipment will, will be, but we wanna ensure that we have quality equipment. We um, were in litigation for many years about a piece of equipment that was refurbished, that failed. Um, we ended up getting a handsome settlement for that, but it kept us tied up in court for a long time um, with a very, potentially very dangerous situation. 
So I don't feel the least bit concerned about putting some parameters around what our expectations are. I think it's really very fortunate that this item was postponed till tonight when we're struggling to supply enough power to our customers here at Independence and all across our partnership and the Southwest Power Pool. I am also wondering where our 50 megawatts is that we purchased from Oneta. How much I, you know, we spent $2 million, we're spending $2 million and we're not getting that power. I didn't spend $2 million so people in Austin, Texas could have it. We have to take care of the city of Independence. This has got to be our number one priority. I agree with that. This is not a situation, this situation that we are living through right now is not going to be something that happens once every hundred years. There's not enough power. That's a fact. This weather, whether it's extreme cold, extreme heat, extreme rain, extreme whatever, is a result of our changing climate, whatever you want to attribute that to, or the cyclical nature of our environment. Um, and we're not prepared for it. Plain and simple. And it's causing an enormous amount of stress on our community right now. And, you know, hindsight, of course, is always very clear in 2020. But I would like, um, and I will work with the city clerk to put this on the agenda for the study session next Monday to start the process of moving forward and making decisions on what we are going, how we are going to provide the power that we need and uh, how we're going to fund and finance the, per the cost of that power. Um, we do not need to wait for the PUAB to give us this direction. This direction has already been given. The priorities were already set. The priorities were to pay off debt. The priority was to do something about our excess revenue. The priority was to return money to the ratepayers. And the next priority is figure out how we're going to generate power for our community. We made a decision a long time ago that we were going to be a municipal utility. And that's our identity in this city. They have pictures of the power plant hanging on walls and <laughs> framed in places. Um, they're in the archives at the Jackson County Historical Society. We are a city with our own power and we're not providing it. So um, this is, um, I'm glad that we took a minute to to relook at this and put a little bit more specificity on this item and bring it back tonight. I think it couldn't be better timing to be having this discussion. And I will be working with the city clerk to put an item on the agenda for Monday so we can continue to have this discussion and we will have it every week until we, if, as far as I'm concerned, until we come to a decision about what we're going to do about this situation. So other discussion. Madam Mayor. Yes. No, I, I, I appreciate uh, what you uh, have said and, and uh, Council Member Huff as well. Um, the fact is that we've, we've been hit with um, two days of, of just uncertainty. Folks are just, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I can't remember a day in my short time where I literally spent the majority of my day on the phone trying to ease people's fears and concerns. Um, I have a daughter who lives in Dallas works for Goldman. She said to me today, she said, gosh, if you guys would have had your power plant up and running, you'd be printing money right now. Those were her words. I mean, that's how much money um, we've lost out on just by not being a generator of energy. Energy is the new gold. Um, and, and the demand for it is going to become greater and greater with less generation plants. This is what's so concerning to me when you look at how many coal plants are going to be taken offline and i read today how many how the car manufacturers are going to start uh, mass producing electric cars well there's going to be more and more demand on the grid 
and uh, our people um, need to have the assurance that as a city that that has a power plant that we will be in the production business and I I have to tell you I am deeply concerned when I hear council members say we should just sell it uh, sell the plant be done with it I I just I just how why so I would say that people are asking us to to take the the time um, to research this to get involved to bring together a plan understand that money is cheap now's the time to, for us to start looking at uh, the, the new plant that we need to build to generate energy yes it's volatile we've already established that with great risk comes great reward we have to have uh, a plan in place to be able to generate this power um, and we we have the golden ticket I don't understand why this is even an issue but I really I really think that our people deserve a council that's going to get their feet wet in this and really begin to tackle the issue of building a plant that creates and, and sells, generates power for its community and, and, and help pay for it through that generation effort. It can be done, and it's going to require us to really – take the bull by the horns and after the last two days I wouldn't even think this is part of the discussion we'd all be saying yes we need to do that and I hope I hope tonight if we can be honest if it's not something you're excited about be honest with us but uh, it's something that we absolutely need to, to tackle head on and know that that as we press forward we need to make sure as a city that we understand that by by building a plant, by coming into agreement that we need to be generating our own power, so that we're not in this place ever again. I lived in five. I lived five years in L.A. Never experienced one blackout until today. This was my first blackout, and I guess what? I'm not in California anymore. I'm in Missouri. Experienced my first blackout. I chose a city called Burbank to live there. Why? Because they had their own power plant, and we never had issues of, of uh, having a gray out or a blackout. So uh, enough is enough. We don't need to let um, unqualified people uh, in the special interest in this city tell us what we need to be doing. We need to make decisions that are right for this city, and I, I hope that uh, we, we take it on. And uh, Mayor, looking forward to your leadership in that effort to, to bring a power plant back online in this city. Further discussion on this item? Yes, ma'am. I, um, yeah, I, I just like to make it clear to everybody that this city generated baseload power from 1955 until uh, whenever Blue Valley went offline last year for 2018 and what that got us was 250 million dollars in debt IPL is 250 million dollars in debt but because uh, uh, our residents experienced 20 minutes or 30 minutes of a power outage we now need to go $500 million in debt. I just want to make sure everybody understands what this is. You know, Texas is on their own grid. The bulk of Texas is on their own. 90% of Texas is on its own grid. They have 77 gigawatt, not gigawatts, is it gigawatts? 77 mm -hmm. gigawatts of production power. 20, they lost 34 gigawatts, went offline. 26, 26 of the gigawatt of the 34 gigawatts that went offline was natural gas and coal-fired plants. The machines froze, the pipes froze. So the big failure here is not green energy. The big failure was natural gas and coal. I get that this is a great time to be opportunistic and to try to continue to scare the residents of independence 
that we need to go as in debt as we possibly can right now. I get that. But whatever plan we pick, if it is a giant power plant or if it's a, a peaking engine, whatever it is, it needs to make sense economically and not as a perspective. We're plugged into the grid. You want to you want to sell our power that we make to the grid to other people? Guess who you're competing with? You're competing with every single company on that grid, which includes private enterprise, which has proven to be more effective and more efficient at producing power. They produce profit for their stockholders. We're two hundred and fifty million dollars in debt. You want to talk about a smart business decision or a council that cares? Let's try not to ruin the city financially. That's all I have. Madam uh, Mayor. Ms. Hart. Yes, just a moment, Councilor Delucci. Do we not all agree that we are losing our ability to generate power to meet the needs of our community? We're relying on six CTs that are limping along. That is undisputable. Those are, those we have to replace what we're currently. I mean, even if we didn't generate an extra megawatt, we got to replace what we currently have. We have an <clears throat> obligation to do that. So this isn't about fear. This is about this situation got a lot of people's attention. Let me just put it to you that way. That it got a lot of people's attention. And yes, we have the ability right now to turn on those CTs and, and produce power. And we have a, a ways to produce power, but those ways are going away. So we have to make this urgent because otherwise we're not gonna have, I, I mean, I, I just don't know how we can look our citizens in the eye and just let this go away. And if you wanna, and if anybody here is talking about selling independence power and light, after we've worked so hard to reduce costs, I understand we have a lot of debt. That debt didn't get here overnight and it's not gonna go away overnight, but we've reduced costs significantly at Independence Power and Light. We've reduced staffing significantly at Independence Power and Light, more than any council in history. Um, we were able to do a rate reduction and we were able to return some money to the ratepayers. If you go up to sell independence power and light, there's gonna be a rate increase the next day. It'll blow you away. And our citizens are gonna to have to pay that. And they're not gonna be mad at the energy company who raised their rate. They're gonna be mad at the council who let that happen. And I'm not gonna let that happen. When I'm dead and gone, <laughs> you know, you can, that can happen. But right now we have an obligation to at least have a plan to maintain what we currently have and meet our obligations to our partners and to our citizens and our ratepayers. House Member Lucy. I just wanna make it clear to the citizens, this ordinance only, this non-ordinance action item only directs the city manager not to consider certain generation machine solutions that are not new or certified remanufactured according to the manufacturer. This resolution does not talk about a power plant. It does not talk about purchasing power from any place else. I just wanna make everybody very clear on that. This is a very narrow ordinance. My objection to it was simply, I did not believe that our experts needed our direction on something so basic, that's it. Yes, and you're correct, Lucy, and thanks for clarifying that. This is simply about providing direction about what our expectations are for quality. We're not making any purchases this evening, but it does um, certainly is very timely discussion to continue to have, and we will. I will make sure that we do continue to have it. Are there any other questions on the, or comments on this item? Madam Mayor? Yes. Uh, one thing I did want to stress there is that you know our water company sells water every day and that's why our rates are cheaper in independence than anywhere else it's a good uh footprint for power and light um number two is i don't know that i really clarified this but as these power plants shut down uh the, the reliability really starts fading 
uh, and next year, next summer even, it could be 100 degrees, they're gonna cut it loose. Next winter, it could be 30 degrees. As, as far as, and I've preached this and preached this, when these coal fires go down, uh, that's uh, for good, that is a base load. I don't think uh, a few council members understand what this bill is. And to say that the reason why Texas failed is because of the power plants is absolutely crazy. A quarter of wind power in a quarter of the power in generated in Texas is by windmills. A quarter of it. So when you shut down a quarter of it because the wind <coughs> are frozen and the solar panels have snow on them and they don't do anything, they go and they fire up all the units that haven't been fired up. That drained the gas. That has caused us to have a gas issue in the Midwest. It has nothing to do with frozen pipes. It has, to, we had to go, the Texas had to go into their uh, stuff that's been sitting there because they've been bragging about their windmills for years. They wanted to be a windmill state and a fourth of their power, like I said, is generated by windmills. When they froze up, they don't have de-ices like they do on airplanes. These babies froze up drop that, they didn't have enough megawatts to support the people down there. They went to fire up their coal fire and gas units, which had not been fired up for a long time. They drained the gas supply. So let's get our things together if we're gonna be an expert on this uh, and go out here and tell people or try to scare people into this. I'm not trying to scare nobody. This is reality. This is, this is happening. We've seen it for the last two days and it's not over with. That's all I have. Madam Mayor. Yes. I'd just like to remind the council too that it uh, doesn't matter whether it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes and I had some people call me that said they were out well over an hour and they had their pipes freezing. One of them was on our police department. So uh, I can tell you that this conversation would be very different if we were facing a blackout in the summertime when people are warm and they could, uh, or hot, they can open up a windows. But when you're in this type of cold, I mean, minus nine this morning, it's a little different scenario. No one's trying to scare anybody. I, I, I genuinely think that we are short-sighted when we think that it was no big deal, it's 20 minutes. My dad was on oxygen last year with lung cancer, stage four was dying. If we'd have had even 30 minutes out on that oxygen, that would have been really hard on them. And I can't imagine the people that were at home that suffered some type of outage that have a reliance on electricity for their medical care or treatments. So, you know, again, I just, I wonder where, where, where we can be heartless and, and, and think that we're trying to scare people. This is not about scaring anybody. This is about leadership. And, and I am grateful that it, that we are now serious about looking for answers to IPL and that we need to make some serious decisions. And I'm just grateful that uh, we're at least talking about it. And I think now it's time for some action. Okay, further discussion? Hearing none, Madam City Clerk, please call the roll on non-ordinance action item number one. Council Members Hoff? Absolutely, yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. DeLucy? No. Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. Item passes. Uh, first readings, Madam City Clerk. Uh, we actually have one second reading, Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. I scribbled right. all over my paper and I missed it. <laughs> Go ahead. With, uh, 21 dash. Yes. <laughs> 21-006, an ordinance amending 1.28.002 of the Independent City Code to increase membership on the Human Relations Commission. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Stewart? Yes. Lucy? Yes. 
Steinmeier? Yes. Hobart? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Now on to our first readings. Bill number 21-007, an ordinance finding, determining, and declaring the necessity of acquiring temporary construction and grading easements and general utility easements for the Bristol Drainage Improvements Project, project number 70131902, authorizing the negotiation and eminent domain proceedings if necessary, approving the plan specifications for the project, authorizing the use of experts as needed, authorizing and directing the execution of documents and the payment of funds to property owners or other holding property rights in conjunction with the project. Bill number 21-008, an ordinance repealing chapter two, alcoholic beverages and adding a new chapter two, alcoholic beverages of the city code. On our information only, um, I just want to draw your attention to particularly our COVID-1970 monthly update. Um, make sure that the, the community knows that that is always available. And the to council member comments. I will start with Councilman Hobart. I, um, I just wanted to thank uh, tonight very briefly all the folks that showed up to talk on the various topics. Uh, I, it's really nice to see that people are paying attention and being involved with the issues before the council. So other than that, obviously, I do hope that folks were able to stay warm the best that they could and that they suffered as little as possible. So um, good rest of the week to everybody. Thank you. Councilman Steinmeier. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, uh, I just want to uh, just reaffirm uh, to our constituents, so many that have called today with their concerns, we've heard you uh, and we understand uh, some of the fears, some of the frustrations that uh, we experienced the last couple of days. Um, these are things that um, we're going to address uh, in this city. These are these these are commitments that we need to make back to you. That that uh, these moments that we've shared in the last couple days um, with blackouts, some longer than others, uh, we understand that. I I think we've learned a lot um, about our communication in our city, uh, what we could do better, what we what we could have done. Uh, to improve it, but uh, all in all, I'd say we we did the best we could with a situation that didn't give us much notice. So, kudos to uh, the folks at the at the city. Thank you for our our guys that are out plowing uh, in the extreme cold. Uh, I heard you last night come down my street at about three o'clock in the morning. Thank you for being out there. It's a tough job and and it's a cold job. And I want to just say thank you to our street. Uh, department for making those efforts. Um, Madam Mayor, I look forward to continued uh, leadership in, in the most pressing issues, and I'm here to help you where I can. So thank you. Everybody stay warm and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Councilmember DeLucci. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Um, City Hall was open today, and I'm I'm thrilled, and I I, I want everybody to understand uh, that we've we've made baby steps, and we've opened the City Hall. You still have to do the social distancing and the masks, and they will have their temperature taken, and all the all the smart moves. But City Hall is open. Um, I would suggest that perhaps we publicize on our Facebook page or the city webpage, actual emergency numbers for people. I had somebody call who only gets water from independents. She doesn't get electricity. And she telephoned in to uh, because her water wasn't working because of the cold. And um, she was only directed to the electric utility line. And so she didn't, she didn't go to that. And I said, no, you, you go to that. But she didn't understand that. 
So if we could go ahead and have emergency numbers, simply put it on the Facebook page. I think that's a pretty good disseminator of information and the city face uh, web page, you know? That's the only suggestion I have. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Stewart. I have nothing tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Perkins. Thanks, Mayor. I just want to give a shout out to uh, the Rotary Club uh, for their fundraising event that they have for the Mardi Gras for Inglewood Arts. They raised over $300,000 last week for this cause. So things are happening and things are moving good. And, and that $300,000 will go a long way for, for their goal of, uh, I believe it's $2 million. So they're, they're pretty darn close now. So congratulations to them. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a great night. Um, Council Member Huff. Yes, uh, I just want to go with Mr. Uh, Councilman Steinmar on the snow removal crews that they've been out there around the clock. Every time it stops, they about get there. It comes in out of the snow. Also, police and fire. We've had quite a few wrecks, and the policemen are out there. 35th and Nolan traffic signal box got tore up real bad. Uh, I was out there for hours out in the cold. Um, the only thing that I'd like to see, this would be towards uh, city manager, on these outages, uh, especially when they're scheduled as such, um, understand that when SPP calls and says, hey, shed your load, then you have so much time to react. And, um, you know, and I understand that part of it. I've been there, done that. Um, when they uh, do that first call and they said, like this morning, for instance, at seven o'clock, the first one hit, um, they, and my, when I was down there, unless things have changed, there is a list of uh, the way they go at it. So they do it by circuits, uh, most times like two or three circuits at a time. They do it through dispatch. Uh, and then of course they move to the next uh, bunch of them. That's all scheduled, it's all written down, it's all documented as part of FERC, it's part of SPP, all these people that get involved in that, you know, we have to have that uh, plan. Uh, I would just like to see, and I know communication is so fragmented, it, it, you know, you get on the social media, TV and everything. Uh, it's so hard to get that word out. And so I know that I caught a lot of phone calls, and I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, if we could be a little bit better uh, about maybe getting that word out, I don't know how particularly, but I did get some calls today that our outage management map was not online. Uh, probably didn't help us, I don't know. Um, like I said, when you know, when we know after the first one that in 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, we're gonna do the other ones, it would be nice to somehow notify people to let them know. I know my parents went to the doctor this morning and forgot all about once the lights are out, they couldn't get the car out of the garage. So stuff like that does affect people. But uh, other than that, I kudos to uh, our city servants. I think they've all done a fantastic job. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, it's been very challenging, obviously, for everybody. And I'm very proud of our staff. I'm extremely proud of our community. People have done a, a great job just Staying home, you know, staying out of the way, letting us get out there and, and do the things that we need to do to get the streets clear, to get the power restored for things that weren't planned, um, which those are occurring as well in this weather. Our police and fire, are, of course, responding to the, the accidents and the emergencies. Um, we have learned, we've been in a state of emergency for almost the entire year. But the current emergency is the one that takes precedence and dealing with all that with that on the top of the um, pandemic that we are coping with every single solitary day um, is a real credit to our our staff and our residents our community our business owners and people who support each other in this town and make sure that they're looking out for each other um good news we are advertising for a digital content manager for the city to provide some additional help in our communications. Um, our public information officer and her staff of one, <laughs> or two people, excuse me, uh, have an incredible task. 
incredible. Uh, I mean, trying to provide all of the information to our citizens when they're, you know, just trying to understand what's going on is an, an incredible undertaking and they've done a remarkable job. And I'm very, very pleased that we are going to be able to add back a position that we eliminated uh, when the pandemic uh, hit to provide some more support there. Um, we're also in discussions, uh, you know, we're always getting calls and meeting people who have services that maybe could help the city. So those, you know, I'm fortunate to be part of those many of the times or have make those connections. But we always want to be innovative. We always want to, the most frustrating thing for all of us is when citizens don't say, I didn't know that this was such and such was going to happen. Now, some of these things, of course, none of us can plan for and um, notify them effectively effectively, but that's something we'll continue to work on. Uh, I did also want to, speaking of our communications team, we are, it is Black History Month. Um, we are doing something different this year for Black History Month. Typically, I do a proclamation recognizing Black History Month, um, but, but we are doing programming throughout the month. Um, to celebrate the achievements of um, Black communities in American history, Black individuals and their accomplishments. Um, so those will be posted on our social media pages. Um, obviously, our social media channels and website have been dedicated to this current emergency, but those will be um, arriving and some of them have already been posted stories from people in our community, essays, videos, interviews. Last evening, I participated in the Truman Roundtable Discussion Group focused on Black History Month, and that um, video of that panel discussion, which was excellent, um, will be posted online as well. So I didn't want to neglect to bring attention to that, which is very important in our community. Um, and I think we're, we're really developing some great content that people will enjoy and learn a lot from. Mr. State Manager, is there anything else this evening? Nothing tonight, thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>